Hello, welcome to the Comic Book Commentary. I'm Bo Leidig, and this week we're going to be diving back into probably my favorite of all of the early Wildstorm team comics with Stormwatch number four. So let's zoom in and take a closer look. First published in August of 1993, we see here on the front cover that it states on the top, Enter the War Guard, and we see War Guard prominently featured. And, you know, it looks fine, but it's kind of my biggest bone of contention with this entire issue, and I'll explain what I'm talking about once we get inside. Brandon Choi, Sean Ruffner, Script, Brett Booth, Pencils, Trevor Scott, Inks, Joe Chiodo, Colors, Mike Heisler, Letters, Brandon Choi, Jim Lee, Co-Creators, Story. The story opens up with our old pal Backlash as he is in the middle of a training exercise in the Combat Training Center, which is essentially just the danger room from X-Men. However, he is being observed by one Jackson King, a.k.a. Battalion, the leader of Stormwatch 1, who is recording a log on the ship's computer talking about how impressive he still finds Backlash's abilities, despite the fact that Backlash is at a rather advanced age to still be doing this sort of thing, and that he hasn't actually missed a beat. He's still, in Jackson's opinion, the fastest and most agile member in all of Stormwatch, even as a guy who's Probably at this point, supposed to be in his late 40s to early 50s. He, of course, being one Mark Slayton, who we know was a part of Team 7. If you'd like to know more about the backstory there, you can check out my playlist on Team 7. Uh, that also talks about a lot of other Wildstorm characters as well. But Jackson gives a lot of high praise here, and he's really uh, intently paying attention to what's going on. And this is due to who Backlash is in there with. As we see Backlash jumping and tumbling through the air, uh, dodging all kinds of lasers and landing on a safety spot, he explains to the two other trainees, both Cannon and Jackson's younger brother Malcolm, that the object is for them to also avoid all of the attacks while getting him and preventing him from landing on this safety zone. Uh, Cannon, once again, fully headstrong, just rushes into battle without even trying to devise any kind of a plan, and Malcolm's like, hey, wait up, man, we're supposed to be working as a team. But Cannon is, has it in his head that he's going to do this all on his own, and he's not impressed by any of Backlash's abilities, as we see him charge up an energy projectile and then launch it at Backlash, which Malcolm finds a little weird, given that this is supposed to be a training exercise, and Cannon is using what is essentially lethal force against their instructor. However, Cannon's tactic actually does work, as Backlash was not expecting him to do that and was caught off guard. Uh, we see an explosion knock him through the air, and Malcolm being, you know, somewhat relieved that their instructor is unharmed. However, we see that his costume and mask have been damaged. And Backlash says, you know what, you screwed up now, Mitchell, which is Cannon's last name. He's like, kid gloves are, kid gloves are off, we're playing hardball. He then unleashes an energy coil and grabs Malcolm by his foot and then immediately swings him around and knocks him into Cannon, knocking them both off their feet. Malcolm asks Cannon what they should do, and Cannon states, you know, stop talking and start fighting. So Malcolm then unleashes his own energy projectile attack. However, Malcolm's attacks are rather unfocused and not used with as much precision as they should be. And, of course, this is due to the fact that Malcolm's only had his powers for a short time and is definitely the rookie on the Stormwatch forces. Uh, we then see that Backlash was actually goading them into this as he states, you know, you should have read your file or the file on me before you came in here. As we suddenly see him disappear into a puff of smoke, uh, Malcolm is shocked when this happens as he sees all of the projectiles he unleashed hit the wall of the facility and bounce off. And this is a safety measure that's designed to prevent any of the energy attacks that are going on within the training center from getting into the rest of the station. But it's also meant to be a training tool to show the people inside what can happen if they're sloppy with their technique or they're not paying attention to whatever other bystanders might be in the, be in the area. 
And now Cannon and Malcolm are both faced with all of Malcolm's attacks coming directly back at them as there's a huge explosion and the two of them go flying. Backlash then reappears behind Cannon, stating, you know, you guys have done really good. You made it almost a full three minutes without almost killing yourselves. He then reaches out his hand to help uh, Cannon back to his feet. But Cannon decides to instead be the world's sorest loser and then immediately just punches Backlash in the face. Backlash, however, is only slightly stunned by this and says, well, you can give it out. Let's see how well you can take it as he rears back and cracks Cannon, knocking him across the room and into the wall. He then looks back and, you know, states to Malcolm, you know, you got anything for me? And Malcolm's like, no, no, man, I'm cool. He's like, fine. He's like, in the future, make sure you're at, you know, point blank range before you unleash an attack like that so that it's harder for people to dodge. He then looks back up to Jackson and states, you know, I really feel like these guys need some more time in the VR sims, but Jackson tells him they've already been through all the VR sims and that from here on out, it's all going to have to be these kind of training exercises. He then tells Malcolm and Cannon to report back to his office and that he wants to have a moment to really like talk about this training exercise and go over where they made their mistakes. Backlash then states, all right, well, if we're done here, I've got more important places to be. And we're going to find out exactly what that's all about going forward. Meanwhile, outside of the Skywatch space station, we see the Voyager 1 spacecraft coming in from its patrol when suddenly the station picks up an explosion near Earth's orbit and tells the men of the Voyager 1 to go investigate it. They immediately oblige, and when they reach the point of the explosion, they're surprised to discover a spacecraft that looks like it's been sheared in half. Weatherman tells them he wants them to investigate and give a full report. They happily oblige. However, in what is going to be a rather crucial mistake, instead of just scanning it from the safety of their craft, they decide to leave the craft and instead board this derelict spaceship that they've come across. As they get closer, they find that there's actually an airlock that hasn't been opened, and the commander decides that he's going to enter because he wants to take a peek at this before they bring it in and the science team gets their hand on it. One of the men protests and states, you know, do you really think this is the best idea? But the commander decides to go through with it anyway and tells everybody to fall in line and for the man inside of the craft to monitor their position and make sure to be ready if they run into any problems. As the men get inside, we find that this is actually one of the demonite spacecrafts that was in the middle of going through the space gate when it collapsed and sheared their ship in half, killing probably dozens of them. But some of them managed to survive and are now inside of the ship, inside of some different tanks and whatnot. And the men who are investigating are like, man, this is tech we've never seen before. However, they suddenly realize that there's movement and that they've been ambushed. There's a huge explosion. One of the men drops his gun and they start yelling in fear and terror as Thompson, who was left on the Voyager 1, is like, hey guys, what's going on? This is, you know, crazy. Lieutenant Riggs, please respond. However, he gets no answer and things are looking grim. But then a few hours later, we see that the Voyager shuttle has returned and that all of the men appear to be fine and are greeted by Dr. Jenkins, the Stormwatch and AKA Skywatch lead physician, who's like, hey, are you guys all right? Everything seemed kind of hairy. And Lieutenant Riggs responds by saying, yeah, that must have been some kind of self-destruct thing that we triggered. We barely got out of there in time. However, we see that he's casting a very unique shadow on the wall behind him. Uh, Jenkins tells him to show up to his office tomorrow after they've rested and, you know, just so we can give them a once over. They say, you know, we'll be sure to do that. We'll see you tomorrow. And as they walk off, however, they start to have a very different conversation and use very different names as the crew of the Voyager craft have now all been possessed by demonites and are just having their bodies used as hosts. Uh, they all confer and agree that Dr. Jenkins will very be or will very easily be able to tell what's going on here and realize that these men's bodies have been taken over 
and that they've got to institute their plan quickly. However, the leader says there's one more person that we have to get if we want to make sure that we can complete our plan. And that person, unfortunately, is on this space station. We're then transported into one of the dining facilities inside of the Skywatch space station as we once again see Major Diane LaSalle, who we were introduced to in issue number three. She, of course, is the one who is in charge of maintaining the containment of Warguard in their cryostasis. And we find out that she's actually actively involved in a long-term relationship with Mark Slayton, a.k.a. Backlash. Uh, they're sitting together, uh, she's having a glass of wine, he's smoking a cigarette, and, you know, he's kind of complaining about the fact that due to her recent promotion, which she's very appreciative of and even says that without Mark's help, she would have never gotten this promotion, but he's upset because now they don't really get to spend a lot of time together due to how much more workload she has. Uh, he states that, you know, we rarely see each other and I'm not getting any younger, and she interrupts and says, oh, so do you want to see other women then? And he becomes flustered immediately and says, no, no, nothing like that at all. What I'm trying to say is, will you? And then he's interrupted by a large hand on his shoulder that belongs to none other than Fuji, who then just decides to crash their obvious date and is like, hey, mind if we join you two? Uh, and I know Fuji's supposed to be like a younger man, so maybe he's not picking up on the social cues here. But there's no reason at all why Winter and Diva should have gone along with this. Like, they should have been like, hey, maybe we don't just interrupt their date, like, mid-conversation. Uh, Backlash tries to shoo him away. However, Diane states, no, it's fine. I had to go, get, I've got to go finish some more work up anyway. And then says, you know, don't worry, Mark, we'll continue this conversation later. We then see the other three members sit down and start ordering drinks. And then Fuji's like, hey, you know... Did we do something wrong? Did we interrupt something? As Backlash just throws his head into his high hands on the table as he was clearly about to propose to his long-term girlfriend and ask her if she would marry him. Uh, she, however, has no idea as we see Diane walking down a hallway back towards her office thinking to herself, huh, I wonder what that was all about. I'll have to ask him tomorrow when we see each other again. As Diane reaches her quarters, she opens the door and is shocked to find that Riggs and Stratton, two of the men from the Voyager craft, are inside of her quarters. And she's like, what are you doing here? And, you know, they immediately state, uh, you're coming with us and you're going to take us to the War Guard Containment Center. Uh, she, however, protests and says, no, the only reason place that I'm going to take you to is to the brig. However, at this point, the two demonites decide that there's no need to keep up the ruse as they immediately shed their host bodies and revert back to their alien forms. Uh, at this point, Diane knows that things are really heating up and is like, holy crap, what are these monsters? They try to grab her. However, she's actually rather nimble and very capable at fighting due to the fact that she's been training a lot with Mark. And, you know, all that training with Backlash is now coming in really handy when she's in a fight for her life. She grabs one of her lamps and uses it as a club to bash one of the demonites across the face. And then immediately leapfrogs over one of the other ones who tries to grab her, even thinking to herself, man, all these workouts with Mark are really paying off at this point. I'm glad I did those. As Diane lands on the floor safely behind the demonite that tried to grab her, she notices that there are two other demonites in the room that she didn't previously see. These, of course, being the two other demonites that possessed two of the other men on the Voyager craft. She decides that she's not going to be able to handle this and makes a beeline for the alarm as she runs over and presses it immediately, uh, stating, let's see how you guys deal with some armed security detail. However, she is now cornered and has nowhere left to run as the demonites close in around her and state that she's going to be helping them in their quest to free the war guard. As we see her scream, she's really kind of got no options left. Uh, Diane, for all of her capabilities, is still just a regular human with no superpowers, and her ability to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with four demonites is pretty much non-existent. Uh, as the alarm sounds, we see the Stormwatch 1 team running towards the place that the uh, alarm is coming from. Uh, 
battalion's already talking to Weatherman, asking him what's going on. We see Backlash run out stating, hey, what's going on here? What do we do? Uh, immediately, Battalion's like, we need to know exactly where this is coming from. And Weatherman tells him that he's pretty sure that the origin is somewhere in the crew quarters and that they're in the me or in the process of finding exactly whose room it's coming from. But he instructs all of Stormwatch 1 to make a beeline for the quarters area so that they can get to the bottom of what's happening on the station. Weatherman then informs them that the alarm sound came from Major LaSalle's room and that there are five entities within her room and one of them is dead. Uh, this, of course, immediately strickens Backlash with fear as he's worried for the safety of the woman he loves. Uh, Battalion says that they're going to head to Major LaSalle's quarters immediately. Uh, Weatherman then decides to start monitoring the location of everyone involved and also is trying to get a fix on where the four entities that are leaving the room are headed to. As Battalion opens the door to Major LaSalle's quarters, they see a body on the floor, and as Backlash approaches it, he finds out that it's actually Ensign Staten, one of the men who was on the Voyager craft, and realizes that something happened when they investigated that derelict craft that they found. Weatherman then interrupts once again and tells them that the four entities who left, one of which is Major LaSalle, are all headed toward the War Guard Containment Center, and that things are going to be very dire if they open that containment unit. Battalion, realizing how bad this situation has just gotten, immediately jumps into action and states that he and Fuji are going to go cover the north exit, and he wants the other members of Stormwatch 1 to follow with Backlash to cover the south end because they cannot allow Warguard to be freed. We then see the, the team led by Backlash jump into action as Backlash instructs D.Va to scout ahead and use her sonic abilities to scout the area, which implies that she can use her sonic abilities not just for attacks, but also for like echolocation and potentially sonar, which is really cool. We then see Cannon grab Winter, who cannot fly, and carry him as he asks, you know, is Warguard really that bad? And Winter tells him, it's beyond your worst nightmares. Uh, we then see Major LaSalle, who is now possessed by one of the demonites, and the other three men enter the containment facility as she approaches the control panel and types in the codes necessary to open the cryo-freeze chamber that the war guard are stuck inside of. Now, the whole plan for the demonites here is that they want to possess the bodies of the war guard because they know that they are potentially invincible and they want to use these bodies to then ultimately conquer the world, which was the whole reason they were coming here at the behest of Hellspont in the first place. As we see the chamber open, we see the three members of Warguard exit, their names being Talos, Hexen, and I think Nykus is the way you pronounce the other one, slowly emerging and not really feeling any fear at who they're seeing because they even refer to them as lambs to the slaughter. They then hear Major LaSalle scream as Backlash is now stricken with worry as he tries to get into the chamber, but Diva won't let him go and states, look, if Warguard is in there, you're not going to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and they'll immediately kill you. But he states, listen, I've got to get to Diane. Like, she could be in trouble. And then we see Diane slowly walking out from the darkness saying, oh, me, lover? You were worried about me? We then get to a big two-page splash where we see Diane stating, well, you know, if you're worried about me, then who's going to save all of you? Because, of course, she's still possessed by one of the demonites. We then see the three members of War Guard standing in front of them as they state, oh, we know you. It was you who imprisoned us so long ago, and now we're going to exact our revenge. Which implies that they're not currently possessed by the other three demonites who had planned on doing that, which is kind of strange. Also, we then see Diva state, you know, hey, we're in real trouble as Battalion asks what the problem is and she lets him know things are getting real bad because they are not prepared to deal with a full-on fight against Warguard as we reach the end of this issue's story. And I'd also like to point out, this is the major problem I had with the cover. The entirety of this book is based around the suspense of whether or not the demonites are going to free the war guard. 
Well, obviously that suspense is non-existent if you have Warguard front and sever on front and center on the cover of the book stating, enter the Warguard. Like you're letting everyone know immediately with the cover that, yeah, Warguard totally gets freed this issue. It's not even a question. When that could have been such an awesome reveal for the end of the book, I am so tired of people doing this with comic books. I've pointed it out multiple times with the uh, Masters of the Universe series that came from DC's New 52 era. Uh, if you'd like to know more about that, feel free to check out my He-Man playlist. But it's just infuriating that like, you have these what should be big reveals, and then you ruin them by just letting everybody know on the front cover what the hell the reveal is. We then reach the Mailstorm section of the book where all of the readers get to submit their own questions and critiques to the creators of the book and see what the responses may be. Um, there's mostly just positive comments throughout all of this. The only critique that people are bringing up is the way that the writing team for Stormwatch is handling the conveyance of accents. Uh, obviously, Stormwatch being an international superhero team that's run by the UN is made up of people from all over the globe who have many different accents depending on what countries or regions they might be from. And it is difficult to convey that in text form. Uh, the two complaints people mainly had were that uh, Hellstrike says bloody far too frequently. Uh, again, he's supposed to be from Ireland, so they want that to be kind of like part of his vernacular, but not in every other sentence. And also that Razor's uh, southern accent feels a little bit too forced and cartoonish. And at, a lot of people are like, you know, it's almost like she's, you're basically trying to make her sound exactly like Rogue from X-Men. And in reality, they may have been. But again, it's a very difficult thing to understand how to convey an accent, especially if that accent is one that you're not all that familiar with. And keep in mind, this is way before you could just look up videos of people talking in a specific accent on YouTube. So it wasn't as if they could just be like, oh yeah, I know what this Irish accent sounds like. I know what this Italian accent sounds like. A lot of it was just kind of like, oh, I think I've heard actors try to convey this in movies before. How do we make them try to convey this in text bubbles and it's tough it's really tough and unfortunately it usually resulted in them going a bit too heavy-handed with it as we move past the mailstorm section we then get an advertisement for the Stormwatch yearbook which is a double-sized issue i'm not sure if i have a copy of this if i do i'll definitely make a video about it and if i don't i'm gonna try and track one down we then get a two-page advertisement for the homage wear, which is t-shirts and ball caps of all of the properties that are being done by homage studios. And holy crap, if I ever came across any of this stuff in like a thrift store or a comic shop of some kind, it would be impossible to not buy it unless it was a t-shirt that was far too small for me to wear. But oh my God, man, I would love to have any of these shirts. A union t-shirt? A union t-shirt. Are we kidding here? And then a cybernary cap? Like, I know 99% of people would not care about any of this stuff, but I would flip my lid if I could get my hands on any of this apparel to just wear out in public and be like, yes, I care about these comic books that most of you have forgotten from 30 plus years ago. We then get an advertisement for the Wildcats and Cyberforce crossover event. I have not made videos about this yet because I have not reached the point in the stories of either one of these series where this event is taking place. However, I definitely will be, so stay tuned. And if you'd like to know more about Cyberforce and Wildcats, you can check out both my Cyberforce and Wildcats playlist. We then get an advertisement for Jim Lee's Sky Caps, which, as I've stated in previous videos, were just Jim Lee's way of creating pogs and not having to pay for the pogs license. But these are literally just pogs. And maybe you care about that, but I certainly never did. It was not a game I ever enjoyed playing. And on the reverse inside cover, we get an advertisement for when Morrison and Capullo took over the duties of Spawn for three issues while Todd McFarlane was working on the Spawn Batman crossover. 
I'm actually well past these issues at this point, but if you'd like to check out my videos on these issues and would like to know more about Spawn in general, you can check out my Spawn playlist, which is getting pretty big at this point. And that was Stormwatch number four. Overall, I think it's a fantastic book, if I'm being quite honest. Uh, first of all, you've got the tie-in from the Wildcats miniseries that directly affects the story and the characters of Stormwatch, and also shows that the Demonites are a threat that all of the characters within the pages of not only Wildstorm, but to potentially Image, are going to have to be fighting. It's not just a problem that the Wildcats are going to be dealing with. Uh, and it's a great way to just start like integrating these stories together. Uh, I also like the dynamic of, you know, showing that Backlash and Diane are in this very serious romantic relationship, and now she's been possessed by a demonite, and now Backlash is having to deal with the danger that this woman that he loves is now in. And, you know, the artwork is fantastic, the story is well written, it's a really good story, and a really great book, and it would only be made better by the fact that if they had kept Warguard or any mention of Warguard off the front cover, it would have been a terrific reveal at the end that they all get freed. And now Warguard are also on the loose, but you had to ruin it by putting them on the cover. When in reality, you could have just as easily put a demonite on the cover and it would have been just as intriguing for anyone who was buying this book to be like, oh crap, the demonites are part of are dealing with Stormwatch now. Like we need to check this out. And that's a great way to also like funnel Wildcats readers into Stormwatch and also show Stormwatch readers that, hey, there's a whole story thing that happened in Wildcats that you should check out, and that provides the backstory for what's going on right here. I don't know what possessed them to put Warguard on the front cover other than the fact that they're like, hey, here's these really hardcore baddies that we created, let's be honest, quite ridiculous costumes for, and we want them to look super cool. And they do, but this could have just as easily been the cover for issue number five, and then you're not spoiling anything. But then again, these are just my opinions. Maybe I'm making too big a deal out of it, but it's the way I think that they should have done things. But your opinions could be completely different. You might have think that, or you might have thought that they handled everything terrifically, and that this cover is not a problem at all and doesn't ruin any kind of reveal. And if that's the case, well, it's okay, because everybody's entitled to their own opinions. If you enjoyed today's video, please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, and thanks for stopping by. Have a great day.